recording. Okay, very good. Good evening. Okay, um, we left off last week in the middle of the bracha <coughs> of Atakadosh. And that will, when we finish that in a few minutes, that'll be the end of the first section of Shemon If you remember, Shemon is divided into three sections. The first three brachot, the central 13 brachot of all the personal requests, and then after that, the last three brachot of Hoda'a and what we will call much later down the road, taking leave, uh, leaving the presence of Hashem, the intense presence of Hashem in the middle of Shmon Esrei. So I'll put on the screen. Where we were holding last week, talk a little bit about one statement here first, which is we say, Atakadosh, you are holy, Vishimcha Kadosh, your name is holy. So I said that last time I want to talk about two things briefly. One is Shimcha Kadosh, your name is holy. And what does it mean? The holy ones bless you every day. So the concept of Shimcha Kadosh um, is, you know, we use the term Kiddush Hashem. What is a Kiddush Hashem? I'll give you an example. Um, a person is in the United States um, and they're standing in line. And this has happened to me more than once. And a clerk gives you, instead of a you know, change for a $10 bill, gives you a change for a $20 bill. And you give the money back. And it's happened to me more than once. Every single time it's happened to me, the clerk is astounded. Like, you for real? You're really giving it big. Most people just walk away and take the money. Now, I don't say anything to her about, well, you know, I, I just say, you know, it's just not who I am. But I'm always with my kippah. So it's a form of Kiddush Hashem. What does that mean, Kiddush Hashem? What is the Shem? Remember, when we say the word Hashem, Hashem, H in English, H-A-S-H-E-M, in Hebrew, hey, Shin Mem, means the name. When we talk about God, we talk about it as the name, because it's the name we don't say. We don't say Ado and Nai in regular speech. We say it in Tefillah, we say it in Brachot. Um, so Kiddush Hashem means the sanctification of Hashem's name. So Shimcha Kadosh means that by our doing some action, we also bring glory to Hashem's name in this world. And there's a lot more Kabbalistic and, and deeper meanings, but I think for, for our purposes right now, we have to understand that and a different level, also in a halachic sense, we also know there are certain names that we're not allowed to erase. So if you have the shame Yudke Vavke, pronounced Ado and Nai, Elohim, uh, other, and other names of Hashem that are written, um, you're not allowed to throw them away. You can't tear them up. Um, so you have to put them in Geniza. In, in, it's called two things. In Israel, it's called Geniza, which means the burial uh, of the product, of the items. In, in the United States, most people refer to the Shemos because the word from the name meaning Shemot, the name uh, names of God that you don't erase. Just as an aside, I've been asked over the years, and it's good to clarify now, that the letters Bet Hey that you put on a piece of paper, or Bet Samach Dalad, which stands for the Aramaic, Besiata Dishmaya, with help of heaven, is not in any way, shape, or form in need of going to Geniza. So if you write a piece of paper, you write a letter, you put the Bet Samach Dalad or the Bet Hey, no problem. You could you could toss it in the garbage. It, it represents something, but it's not holiness in and of itself. Who is the, who are these kedoshim b'chol yom yahalu chasel? Who is it that are uh, these these uh, holy ones bless you all the time? And I'm using that term as blessing you uh, or praising you. Um, but who is it? So there's really only apparently one opinion that seems to say it refers to the angels, which would fit into a part we skip, which is Kedusha. When we do Kedusha, we talk about um, we, that we want to sanctify God's name here in this world, like it's sanctified in the heavens by the angels. We say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Again, we're going to get back to Kedusha much later down the road. I don't want to get into it now. But so there's one opinion that says that the, the Kedoshim, that the, the holy ones that praise you every day are the angels. However, most opinions are it's you and me. What makes us holy? Well, who said we're holy? So Hashem did. So Hashem's in, in um, I think it's Perakutet in Shemot, before the giving of the Aser Tadibro, the Ten Commandments, it says that Hashem says, 
the Goy Kadosh. You will be a nation of priests and a holy nation. We defined last week a little bit of what holy meant. It meant anything that brings you closer to God, brings you closer to, to spirituality, closest to Hashem, sanctification of Hashem. That's considered holy. Everything else is par or goes the other way, God forbid. So that we, as a people, are considered a Goy Kadosh. We say it in Shmon Esra and Shabbat at Mincha. Right? And we also refer to ourselves as a Goy Kadosh and Am Kadosh. So many different places. Now you would think that to be an Am Kadosh or Goy Kadosh, a holy people, we are inherently that way, that we don't really have to work on it. No? Like, for example, let's say it would be a, uh, a good character trait to have blue eyes. It's not, but let's just say it is. So a person who has blue eyes, they don't have to work on doing that. They have blue eyes. That's who they are. Maybe someone who doesn't have blue eyes wants to somehow wear contact lenses to make them have blue eyes. I mean, it's a little strange but as my example, but if we're an Am Kadosh, if we're a holy people, and we refer to ourselves here, Goshim, Yom, Yalu, Chasela, that the holy ones, us, we give praise to God every day. What does it mean we have to work on aspects of Kedusha? So we look at uh, two things. One is a quote from the Gemara that tells us as follows. We have a mitzvah in the Torah. It's one of the mitzvot that we have to sanctify ourselves and be sanctified. I'm not going to get into the details of why that it, it does sound redundant. But right now, for our purposes, just let's say there's a mitzvah that we have to sanctify ourselves we have to bring ourselves to a higher level of holiness. We have to do things that are in sync and in concert with holiness. And the Gemara explains, Adam mekadesh atzmo me'at. A person does a step. They do a little bit. They try to grow somehow in Kedusha. What happens? Because to harbe. Then Hashem kicks in, so to speak, and in Mekadesh, he raises that level of Kedusha. Milamata, if we do something down here in this world, then Hashem again will do sanctify that person from above. We do something in this world that we come sanctified in the world to come. That's a topic we've discussed and we're not going back into. But what's this point of this Gemara? Hashem does not expect us to be perfect. That's for sure. Hashem also does not expect us, for the most part, for most people, what we call the benoni, the average person, to spend day and night immersed completely in trying to sanctify themselves. It's not normally done by most people. There are a handful of people that that's their life, that they're, that's their life. But the average person walking down the street, religious Jew, doesn't spend their entire day trying to look for things and do things at every single second of the day that will elevate their Kedusha. If you strive for it, you do things, we're going to see also how this works into our daily lives. But it does tell us that if we do a little bit, then a tremendous amount will grow, will happen. Hashem helps us. That's the same topic we've seen elsewhere in many places. Uh, that down the path a person wishes to go, they take him. He's, he's, he, you, know, you make your bed, you're going to sleep in it, whatever the expression is. And I put here in parentheses, just as a note to highlight it, something I want you to remember to mention, which I think really does help us understand a little bit more about what does this mean, God's involvement. On a daily basis, when when Tachanun is said, um, the long Tachanun, in, in Nusach Ashkenaz, it says, uh, yad la uh, Hashem opens up his hand for sinners. What does that mean? Hashem's here. Okay, you want to do tshuva, you want to make kadesh yourself, you want to sanctify yourself, you want to grow, here I am, I'm here to help. We go through a very intense period of time, which is coming up in just a few weeks, which is Rosh Chodesh Elul, until after Ne'ilah on Yom Kippur. It's 40 days, the most intense 40 days of the Jewish calendar. And we all try to do a little bit better, especially in Elul. Then we get to Rosh Hashanah. We try, we're going to change things. We get into start to make Shuva, and we get to Yom Kippur, and we start making hachratot. We can start making decisions. Okay, I'm not going to be perfect. I know I'm not going to be perfect. 
But I'm going to try doing something a little bit more. I'll be more careful with brachot. I'll be more careful with not speaking Lashon Hara. I'll be more careful with the bench. I'll, whatever it might be. After all this time of 40 days of slichot and of, of saying al -chet, and all the five tefillot of davening of, of Yom Kippur, at the very, very, very end, literally the end of Ni'ilah, as you're, before you step out of Shemona Esrei, Hashem, we say in the, in the Shemona Esrei, Ata noten yad lapushi. You stretch out your hand, you give your hand to those who are have sinned. What does that mean? That we try our best, we do our best, and during the course of the year, Hashem's hand's here, waiting for us to do something. We take the action. He grabs our whole, a hold of us, so to speak, and raises us up. That's exactly this idea of you try to sanctify yourselves, and you become holier because Hashem will help. But when it comes to the end of the ilah, in a sense, what we're saying, metaphorically, is you've done your best in Slichot. You've done your best by trying to get yourself to Shul. You've done your best by trying to add something daily to do a little bit better. You've done your best in your Tfilot. You've davened uh, Kol Nidre and Marev and, and Shachari and Musaf and Mincha and Nila. And you come to the end and Hashem says to you, I'll tell you what, you've done a great job. And even if you didn't do a great job, we say, Atan no ten yad la poshin. You're not waiting. It's not reactive, like we say all the other days of the year. At the time of the end of the Ila, it's it is proactive. Hashem gives his hand and he takes us by the hand and draws us, ourselves closer, draws us closer to him. So 99% of the year, Hashem is waiting us for to take that step. As we approach the last few minutes of Ni'ilab, or hopefully we've come to a spiritual high, the best part of the entire Aseret Emei Tshuva, as far as I'm concerned, understand that Hashem says, Yashikoch, you did the best you could. I'm here. I'm going to take it from here. That's what this bracha is about. That we have this opportunity every single day. And this is what the Gemara is about. We have this opportunity every single day that Hashem's waiting for us to do something. And when we do it, Hashem wants to help us. Hashem wants to kick it up because it's only better for all of us when, when Hashem does that as well. I'm going to show you one more slide on this topic. And the question comes up, like, I understand how you increase your Kedusha when it comes to davening, brachot, mitzvot, that's very good. But what about day to day? You go to work, you go to exercise, you eat. So for those of you who've learned Misiyat Misharim, you've heard this before. This is from Misiyat Misharim on the topic of Kedusha. I'm going to read this and we'll explain and we'll see what this means. Ahishtadlut hu. Now, so before this, the, the Ramchal, the Moshe Chaim Lutzat, author of the Misiyat Misharim, says that we have to make the effort to remove ourselves from the physical and try to elevate ourselves spiritually. And what does he mean by this? Now, keep in mind, this is very late in the book. And as you get to this part of the book, it's for Yechidim, for just individuals who are able to really strive for this highest level or this almost highest level. But it, no matter what, where a person's holding in life, they still have ability to grow a little bit. Aishtadlutu, the actual exertion, as he translates here, they're really trying. What does it mean? Again, this is something he's saying that for most people is almost impossible. You detach yourself from the physical completely. That you cling to God spiritually at all times. It's all about God. It's God, God, God. It's tefillah. It's, tfilah, it's learning. It's Torah. It's mitzvot. And in this way, the Nevi'im were also referred to as malachim or angels. Why? Because that's all they are. They're all only spiritual. As it says by Aaron in Malachi, English. For a priest's lips shall guard knowledge and Torah shall be brought, sought from his mouth, for he is an angel, Lord of hosts. So we see that in Malachi, that a person who gets to that spiritual level is referred to, a Navi is referred to as a Malach or an angel. The Omer, and it quotes another Pasuk, now, here's what I want you to, to see this part here. The Ramchal understands, as do all rational human beings, you cannot live your life 100% spiritually because you need to eat, you need to sleep. There are things that we have needs for physically that Hashem gave us, uh, built into our, our, our bodies, into our brains, into our hearts that we need in life. We can't just be spiritual and say, oh, I'll live off of the air and I'll just daven and, and learn all day. You need to eat. Even when a person's engaged in physical actions, 
המוכרחים לו מפאת גופו, אבל he needs, we need for our bodies. הנה לא תזוז נפשו מדבקותה העליון, you should not budge, move from clean to Hashem, עניין שנאמר דווקא נפשי, אחריך כבי תמך ימיניך. My soul clings after you, your right hand supports me. What does this mean? So let me explain. Again, for some of you, this is um, review. First, we would have been learned in Mesir Sharim and in other topics we brought up uh, when we learned together. When a person eats, for most people, it's not a spiritual experience. Unless you go sit down in front of your favorite meal, a very special restaurant, and it's a romantic evening, it's, maybe it elevates and gives a little different, different feel. But you sit down on a regular Tuesday night to eat uh, dinner, In most cases, they don't, most people don't look at it as a spiritual experience. But that's not right. What we should be doing is that we understand when we make a bracha on the food, we stop for a second. Make a stop for a millisecond even. Just think why you're making your bracha. It's not blah, 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 and then you start to eat. That's first of all. Second of all, why do we eat? Because we, we have to survive. But why do we want to survive? What do we want to, why do we want to live? Because we want to see Hamas destroyed. Yes, we want to see the Hutim all drop dead. Yes, we want to see them all get sick and die and, and have and horrible diseases and all be sick and all our enemies should wither and die and, and claim God as God. Yes, we want to see that too. But ultimately, we want, we're here to serve Hashem. So if we stay healthy, we eat properly, we stay healthy, we exercise. It's hard for me to say that, but we, I know I do walking this. That's, that's good, but I, I know I need to do more. Um, But all that we do with the Shem Shemayim, you do it because you want to stay healthy to serve Hashem. That's an inyan of Kiddusha. You're taking the mundane, you're taking the physical, and you're elevating it to a different level. If a person decides, you know, there's an old line, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? Uh, people say, oh, I love pizza. No, you love yourself. So therefore you want to eat the pizza because it tastes good. You don't love pizza. Um But you say, I, I love Hashem, and therefore I want to eat the pizza, which tastes good, but it nourishes me, whatever the food might be for you, and therefore you want to be healthy and stay stay in good shape, because this way you live longer, therefore you can do more mitzvot. Because when a person passes away after 120 years, they don't do mitzvot. I'm forgetting for a moment what we talked about, about people who come back after Tchiaf and team, they do mitzvot, don't mitzvot. I'm talking about now, here and now. And therefore, you achieve holiness even in the most mundane possible things, such as eating and exercising and sleeping also. When we don't take care of ourselves, when we don't go to sleep at a good time, we don't have enough sleep, and we're tired throughout the day, it affects us in so many ways. And I can tell you that this weather, this summer, um, is debilitating. First of all, if you're not drinking enough, that's also very important. Um, but the weather's been debilitating. It's hard sometimes to focus, it's hard to get motivated. But if, you, if you're a morning person, you try to get as much as you can done. If you're an evening person or a night person, which I don't even understand that type of personality, um, but it's not who I am. Uh, so you get yourself motivated and get find when the right time is for you and do the best you can to grow, to add just something in there for your day, whether it's adding a little bit of Torah, adding a mitzvah uh, that you don't, you're not so good at or you don't do. Um, being involved with other people's lives. So I'll add parenthetically, that's part of what I'm going to be talking about. Wednesday night, Bezrat Hashem, at Bnei Shmuel, Marv's at 8.15, then in the show at 8.30, I'll be giving a talk um, having to do with Emuna and dealing with the current Matzav here in Israel, um, anti-Semitism in general, but mostly having to do with Israel. And uh, I'll be addressing some of this uh, then as well. One more comment on this particular bracha before we start talking about an introduction to uh, to the central part of Shwana. So let's go back to the first slide. And you'll notice that normally during the year, 95, 99% of the time, we say, Blessed are you, Hashem, the Almighty, the Holy One. During the Aseret Yemei Tshuva, this stands for the Aseret Yemei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance from Rosh Hashanah through the end of Yom Kippur, those are 10 days, we say, Baruch HaTashem HaMelech HaKadosh. We change the words to, you are, the, you are Hashem, the King, the Holy One. So first, this is an aside, if you don't say HaMelech HaKadosh, you said HaKel HaKadosh, and you continue on your merry way, you have to go back to the beginning of Shemona Esra and start all over again, because it's as if you didn't say the Shemona Esra. Why is it so important? 
And why do we say and change to Hamelech HaKadosh? Years and years ago, I gave a shiur on the topic of the 13 attributes, Hashem Hashem Kerachum Vechanun, and proved that this isn't my Torah. I, mem- I, I, I read something and I built on that. I don't remember who was the original, or I saw this. That when we say the attributes of Hashem, Hashem Hashem Kerachum Vechanun, Erech HaPayim, Erech Chesed, then met, you are, you are the merciful, you're the beneficent, you're the one who gives Chesed. It means we're not just saying Hashem when these attributes, but every time we say them, we're enabling these attributes to come down into this world more and more. Every single time we say you what are called the Gimel Mido, the attributes of God. The same is true when it comes time to Rosh Hashanah. If you were to encapsulate the job that we have on Rosh Hashanah, it's not true. It's not really. That's more for the general term of Aseret Me and especially on Yom Kippur. But we have a job on Rosh Hashanah, which is the Hamlich Kuchabrihu. Hamlich Kuchabrihu is the Aramaic words of to accept or to coronate our God. We accept Hashem. And by the way, people, myself included, that will say on the night of Rosh Hashanah, in the tefillah or some point, I accept Hashem as my Melech. It's very important because that's your job on Rosh Hashanah. But what happens when we do that is similar to the idea of Hashem Hashem Kel Rahu. That every time we say that I accept Hashem as my Melech, I coronate God. The word coronate, the word crown. Same word crown also means the top of the head. Um, it brings more of that kedusha of the Malchut of Hashem into this world. So since our job is to coronate God, if we don't say Hamelch HaKadosh, we, we, you had one job to do, right? You had one job to do and you didn't do it. You missed the boat. You got to go back to the beginning because the, we predicate the rest of Shimon Esri on that acceptance of Hashem as the Melech, as the Melech HaKadosh. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that I really, really enjoy teaching Tefillah is when we get to this point of the davening. I enjoy everything I teach. I enjoy from the beginning of the brachot until we finish with Aleinu and the Yom and everything else. But it is the central portion of Shemona Esrei that I have a personal affinity for, love teaching, and there's just so much to talk about. In order to do that, we need to we need to have some background. And in order to have that background, I need to introduce you to somebody, not physically. If you are in the Jewish history class, you know that we've been we've been talking now for the last few weeks about the golden age of Spain. And in the golden age of Spain, um, say the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, and 1400s, there have been, there are many, many personalities that many of you have heard of uh, who impact us to this day, including, of course, the Rambam, the Rif, the Rosh, who we're learning about now. But there's one name I did not mention in the Jewish history class, and I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes. Uh, who lived, um, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you his bio in a second, who lived around the same time, he was uh, in the mid to late 14th century. And the idea is that in order to understand a lot of the tefillah, the central part of Shemona Esrei, including some halachot, which I'll give you one example in a few minutes, um, we need to know this one person. I will quote, I will quote commentary over the next few months a lot from someone who is known as the Abu Draham. You may know someone who has a family name, Abu Draham, Abu Draham, 100% they're descendants of the, that individual unless they just changed their name. He lived in Seville. I want to just talk about him for a few minutes because he is a, you know, it's one thing I say, okay, the Ramban tells us that, okay, so you have a general idea who the Rambam was, Ramban. Most people may have heard of the Abu Draham, but most people have heard of him, don't necessarily know why he was so important. So let's. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about him, and then we're going to. I'll give you one example of what he tells us when it comes to the first bracha of the central part of Shemona Esrei, and then we'll move along from there. So his main thing that he's known for is his commentary on the Siddur. Uh, he was a student of someone named Yaakov Ben Asher. So for those of you who are in the Jewish history class, you'll know that Yaakov Ben Asher was the son of the Rosh, who we were just learning about last week. Um, he saw that there was a very big um, gap. There's a big gap in what people needed to know and what they actually did know. Um, 
And therefore, he felt that it was important to start to disseminate information about the about Judaism and specifically having to do with tefillah. He came out with a book, uh, which was known as the Abu Draham, just named after him. Uh, there actually is no specific title. It was called, I have it written down here, Chibur Peyush HaBarchot HaTfilot, a, a, a compendium of, of explanations, of, of blessings, and prayers. Because originally it was written as a running commentary for the, the davening. It wasn't necessarily meant to be a book that people use as a reference. It's big, it's thick, there's a lot there. And what he wanted to do was to afford people this ability to understand more of what they're diving. Let's let's jump forward to the, the 20th century for a minute. It's the early, early 20th century. People are starting to influx of, of Jews coming to the United States and Canada, especially. Um, tens of thousands of people are coming in, refugees from Europe, Eastern Europe, and others, other countries. And in many cases, some of them are coming and don't have a very good education, and some have a very good education. But if they didn't work on their education, they didn't, and they decided, okay, they're coming to the new world, they're going to throw some of this off, they're not going to work on Shabbos, whatever it's going to be, things change and start to deteriorate. At that time period of history, there were some issues with the level of knowledge, which we talked about the Ibn Ezra, why you also saw one of the things that motivated him to do a lot of writing, Ram, the Rambam for sure, trying to bring the concept of halacha in a very organized way to the people. Um, so what he decided to do was he, wanted the people to use the, the tefillah intelligently. So in the 20th century, you started to have coming out books with Hebrew English um, sidurim, so which was nice. But with the only downside of just plain translation is it's exactly that. So sometimes a word in Hebrew, you translate to English, it still misses the essence of what you're trying to say. Um, and therefore, that's why over time, over the last, few, uh, last many many uh decades there have been an explosion in 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 jewish books uh that have come out that explain more than just translating words but the depths of meanings whether it's on tefillah or in humash and gemara which is amazing but for us for our purposes here we're talking about tefillah so what happened back in the 14th century with the abu Graham, who's giving a running commentary on tefillah so that people could understand it is very similar to what was happening in the early 20th century in the United States and Canada of bringing books to the masses that start to bring out um, commentaries for people to have a deeper understanding. He took information on tefillah, on the meanings from the Gemara, from the Talmud Bavli, the Talmud Yerushalmi. He took it from the Gonim, people of his own time, and he used it to explain every section of the Sidor. <clears throat> In addition to that, he also would explain rituals, why we would do certain things. Now I'm gonna making up the next thing. I didn't, I don't know if he said this or not. He would explain in his Sidor, for example, why in the morning of Hoshana Rabbi, we would take five Hoshanot and we have the bandit and we, we smack him on the ground and why we do that. So he would explain that also. He also was very much as we've seen in the Jewish history class on some other people, very much into calendar. And he wrote a whole thing about the Jewish calendar. And he's absolutely clear about this, that he's not claiming he's any, writing anything new. He's just why he calls a Hebrew. It's a compendium, very much like the Balatanya, the Agmar Zakein or the Alta Rebbe who wrote Tanya. He's called a, a Likute Amarim Tanya. It's a, it's a, a, a Likut. It's a compendium of things meaning he's not saying anything of his own, that's, which obviously was his own um, humility. Of course, there's all kinds of new things in there. But he's writing this, this commentary uh, that became not only valuable, but maybe even invaluable, became extremely necessary uh, that, that people for generations could not understand the Siddur without. And the proof is, here we are 600 years later, and I'm quoting him. Right, it's one thing we know we quote Rashi every day and talk around Bonnet or Achaim, but here you have somebody who put together a book that explains Sidur, and 600 years later, it's as relevant today as it was 600 years ago. That's amazing. He also in, uh, in, in, uh, put in there in the Tefillah about uh, grammar, grammar and how that affects the Tefillah, which we'll talk about. Like I mentioned, some couple things, and also a little bit of common sense in Tefillah. Um, he was very qualified to do this. He was very knowledgeable. 
And that's the, like I say, that's the man known as the Abu Jahl. So, okay, so we learned a little bit about him. It's important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you a slide. We can take a look at the beginning of, like have an introduction to the central portion of Shimon Esri. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. So if you didn't know that, now you know. It. The intro to the central 13 brachot. I call it here the heart of the Shimon Esri. Let's go back. And I'm going to re remind you, for those who came a little bit late, the general structure of Shimon Esri. The first three brachot, which we just finished, the last three brachot, the hoda'ah, the giving thanks to Hashem, the acceptance of tefillah. And then you have the central portion, which is 13, used to be 12, then became 13. Well, when we get to the bracha of that extra one, we'll see. And that's really the heart of Shimon Esrei. It's the personal requests. It's the personal and national requests for for anyone who has anything to ask for. You're not allowed to insert anything in the first three brachot. And in the last three brachot, you don't really add anything either. Only in a little kind of so at the end. So this is the part. This is the Shimon Esrei part where it really is involving us. And again, I'll be talking a little bit about this Wednesday night, actually, as well. I mentioned uh, David Abdaham already. He has an amazing, makes an amazing connection. Um, a chiastic structure means A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. Kind of like things that connect from, um, in, in, um, from one end to the other. So he has what's called, he sees a very strong chiastic structure, the central part of Shemona Esra. I'm going to just go through this briefly. The first bracha is the bracha of Dat, Ladam Dat, and he connects it to the bracha, um, many brachot later, of Kibbutz Galuyot. This is bracha number one and bracha number seven. Um, the Gemara brachot says that in order to build Beit HaMikdash, which is the concept of the re in gathering the exiles, building Beit HaMikdash, um, we need it, the eventual uh, action that will happen as a result of building Beit Hamikdash is the man dat aretz, that all people have this higher, the highest level of dat uh, of knowledge, of intellect. So he connects those two. The next two, bracha two and bracha eight, is the bracha of chuba and the bracha of mishpat. Um, again, in order to do proper chuba, one has to have proper guidance, scholars. Bracha three and nine, slicha and birkat aminim. Birkat aminim is the bracha b'lam al-shinim al-tei tikva. Bracha of slicha, slach lanu. We ask for slicha, we ask for forgiveness, and we uh, understand that we are very susceptible to sin. Um, hmm. I, I wrote something wrong here. Birkat aminim, yeah, no. Birkat Aminim is the bracha like, all right, Lama Shanim. I got a little confused here in my head. I'm looking at my notes and I'm looking at the screen. I thought they didn't match. They do. Sorry. I'm bad. Um, we it, we understand that we're our, on our, by our own, we can mess up. We ask for Slicha. But in addition to that, there are people out there who go out of way to try and mess us up. They were the people who were the, the tail bearers and tried to get the Jews in trouble. Remember our own worst enemies, even today, literally today, today, some of our own worst enemies are Jews. And we have to be very careful about that. So that can makes the connection between not only ourselves needing slicha from things we've done ourselves, but on the other hand, we have to be asking Hashem for help that he obliterates those that are trying to get us into trouble. But, uh, number four, Geula and Allah Tzadikim. We ask Hashem to see our affliction, which is the bracha of Geula. And then we ask for the Tzadikim of the door who will ask of the generation, who will ask for Rachamim, for mercy on our behalf. Number five, Rifa Eno Hashem asking for Hashem for health, health and for healing, rather. And the concept of Binyan Yerushalayim, the building of Yerushalayim. The destruction of Yerushalayim, the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, was in a sense a cardiac arrest for the Jewish people. We know that Yerushalayim is the beating heart of Judaism, is the beating heart of the world. Ki mitzion tetzei Torah. Mitzion is, is Yerushalayim. So we're asking Hashem that not only a refuah for ourselves, but also a refuah for Yerushalayim, again, that connection. And finally, number six and number 12, Birkat HaShanim. Birkat HaShanim is the bracha where we talk about, um, which re refers to Parnassah, we talk about rain, and we talk about tal, we talk about dew, but the ultimate bracha is about Parnassah and growth. 
and prosperity. And that connects to the Malchut Beit David um, in order that we will um, flourish in the time of the, of the of Mashiach. It says that we won't have to necessarily, according to one opinion, work for any food. They'll say that the ground will grow gluskaot. Gluskaot are like lachmaniot, rolls. So instead of having to take the wheat and to, 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 to separate the wheat from the chaff and to do all the steps to make it to flour, to make it to dough, to make it to bread, it will grow miraculously out of the ground. So instead of having to work necessarily, according to one opinion, if you remember the last couple of Shirim, there'll be miraculous things that will happen for our panasa, for our food and everything else. Okay, I'm going to just give a couple of minutes um, on the bracha that we're going to learn next, which is, ah, sorry, there's one more thing. Oh, and now I'm not going to do this. Okay, which is the bracha batachonen. I'm going to use, of course, since almost everyone who is on uh, David's Nusach, Nusach Ashkenaz, I'm going to only stick with right now Nusach Ashkenaz um, and go with this and mention a couple of points and then we're going to stop. The tra- First, you'll see the bracha. Atacho, and then I'm going to tell you something about the Abu Gerhaman here. Atacho ne ladam da, you favor or you grant man perception, um lamed le enosh bina, and you teach mankind understanding, perception, understanding. Let's we'll see what the differences are at some point. Chonenu meitacha, grant us from you dea, knowledge, bina, understanding or insight. Haskel, intellect, this sounds like a very fine line. They all sound like the same kind of word. It almost sounds like a thesaurus of words having to do with intellect. And we say, Hashem Blessed are you, Hashem, the one who grants perception or knowledge, maybe wisdom. So there's a lot of, to, to take care of here. First, I'm, I'm going to just mention two things. Number one, as I mentioned before, there's a concept that we'll see many times in Shimon Esrei, that we saw before is called a milamancha. Milamancha is a word. There's no real translation into Hebrew, into English for that. It's a concept. It's a word or a phrase that repeats itself many times. And here you have the word, the chet nun nun um, word, or shoresh rather, appear three times in a very in very short order. Um, so we'll see what that is, what, what that has to do with anything. But I want to just mention something now. I mentioned the Abu Draham. So I'm going to mention something he tells us about this bracha because I think it's it's kind of beautiful insight. We know that on Mosei Shabbat um, in Shmona Esrei that it, we say mm-hmm. and then we insert Havdala, whether it's at, uh, whatever version you say Adot Bizar Ashkenaz, but everyone says it at this point in Shmona Esrei. So Abu Duhan asks why. Matter of fact, the Gemara has a whole discussion when it should be inserted. And not everyone agrees it should be inserted here, but the conclusion, the halacha conclusion the Gemara comes to, and then later on the Rambam and the Shulchan Aruch say, this is the point in Shemona Esrei where you insert Havdalah. For those of you who don't necessarily say Tila Motzei Shabbat, so now you know that on the, in the Motzei Shabbat um, Shemona Esrei, we insert Havdalah. If you forget it, you don't repeat Shemona Esrei, we rely on the fact that you're going to be saying Havdalah on a kos, on a, on a cup of wine. Um, so the Rabbi Draham asks a simple question. Why here? Why not in some other bracha? So the simple answer you can give is, this is the bracha about da'at, about knowledge, intellect, insight, understanding, wisdom. In order to be able to differentiate, what does the word Havdalah mean? To differentiate, right? Just to separate. To make that division, that distinction, you need wisdom, you need intellect, you have to understand what's the difference between day and night, what's the difference between human, uh, Jews and non-Jews, what's the difference between light and dark. So that's a very common, basic answer why it's in this bracha. Listen to what Abu Dhabi says. There's a halacha that on Shabbat, you're not allowed to daven for personal requests. There are two reasons why we don't say the, the central portion of Shabbat Hashem on Shabbat. Number one, it would make the davening too long and therefore be, 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 be cause people um, to be to feel uncomfortable. Like, come on, let's go already. But a more, more a deeper reason is that we're not allowed for various reasons to daven for personal requests on Shabbat. You can daven for communal requests. That's fine. But personal requests, you're not allowed. To. So therefore, we don't say the central portion of Shabbat Hashem on Shabbat. Now, when we start Shmon Esrei, Motzei Shabbat, it's still Shabbat. 
We haven't yet ended Shabbat. So how can we ask for personal requests? Therefore, the Abu Draham says, we insert the Havdalah in this first bracha so that this way we can make personal requests. And he proves it. Every other bracha in the central portion of Shimon Esrei starts with the request. Slach lanu, hashivenu, uh, this doesn't start with a request. It starts with a statement and then a request. It says, It's a statement. That's all it is. It's not a request yet. We insert a havdala, and then we make our first request. Give us, you know, grant us, and we'll talk about next time what that means, that word. Grant us knowledge, wisdom, and insight. So that's an example of the insight that we get from the Abu Draham, which is why I want you to know who he was. So, Bezrat Hashem, let me just take a quick look at the calendar. Um, I want to take a look to make sure. There's a lot of stuff coming up next week. Okay, yes, that's what I thought. I am not giving class next Sunday night. I'm actually going to be in Karmay Gat um, um, to promote my book. For those of you who don't have it, please be in touch. We have to sell you each 20 copies. Nice discount. <laughs> Um, so I'll be in Carmigat next Sunday, so we will not be having class. And it's not like I can give an alternate night next week, unfortunately, um, because it's kind of a busy time. Um, again, a reminder, I will send out a update, a reminder probably tomorrow at some point or Wednesday, the program at Pnei Shmuel Bezat Hashem at 8.30, right after 8.15 Mariv. Um, that will be uh, at Pnei Shmuel, as I said. And um, there's going to be another program that I'm working on. That'll be, uh, I'll, I'll explain on Wednesday night uh, when what when it is and what it will be. In the meantime, wish everyone a Shavuot Tov. We should hear more good news and more Yamach Shemamim wiped out every single day. And this, this, uh, this new Mivtza that we um, have undertaken with Yemen, it's called Yad Awuka, the long hand, to show that the hand, long hand of Israel goes far. But we understand it's really the Yad HaChazaka, uh, the Israel that you have Hashem. Uh, we're just uh, Hashem's uh, messengers in this world to take care of what needs to be done. Have a wonderful evening. Shavuot.